So I want to thank you all for being here and want to open up in a word of prayer before we get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you now just thanking you and praising you that you've allowed us to be here this day. Father, we thank you for allowing us to get all the technical issues resolved. And I just pray, Father, that you would speak through me today and show us your heart for prayer and that there are reasons when you tell us no. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Be honest. Have you ever prayed for something in earnest and had God tell you no? All the time, right? It happens to all of us. So what I want to talk about this morning is the fact that God does tell us no. There are often reasons. Well, there's always a reason. We don't always know what those are because God in his infinite wisdom knows much more than we do. So I want to just just kind of dissect this whole process and give us a new understanding of it this morning. And this message came to me in a very unusual way. Those of you who know me know I love music. I really love messianic music, and I also love some of the old classic contemporary Christian music. Uh, artists such as David Meese, Michael Carr, Keith Green, those folks, I mean, they just really laid a solid groundwork for contemporary Christian music. And I thought I pretty much knew all of David Meese's music, but just a few short weeks ago, I had a song come up on YouTube that I was not familiar with, and it floored me. It slapped me straight in the face. And I want to share that song with you at the end of this lesson this morning. And since we got started late, I'm going to go rapidly, so forgive me, but I do want to be able to share that song with you because I think it will speak to you the way it spoke to me. So what I want to do this morning, this lesson will be in four parts. First, I want to talk about prayer itself, and I want to focus on the types of prayers that God answers in the affirmative when we pray them. The second part will be when God says no and some of the more common reasons for his denial. Then I want to talk a little bit about whether it's possible to change God's mind and whether we even should. And then also want to end with how we should respond when God tells us no. So what I want to do is start out with prayer in general terms. That's the first part, part of this. And there are numerous verses in the Bible that tell us that our Heavenly Father hears the prayers of the righteous and that he answers us. There's John 14, verses 13 and 14, that tell us whatever you ask in my name, and this is Yeshua speaking, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Luke 11, 9 says, So I say to you, again Yeshua speaking, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. John 15, 7 Yeshua again says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Matthew 21, 22 says, and all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. And in 1 John 5, 14 says, this is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Now be honest. Have you ever used any of those verses in prayer, taking the position that God had to give you what you were asking for because you had asked in faith? I think we've all done that. But guess what? God is not some magic genie in a bottle that if we ask a prayer in a certain way and do things just exactly as a formula subscribes, that he has to respond in the exact way we want him to. Because he, his will and our will may sometimes be different, and he knows better what we need than we know ourselves. Now, don't un misunderstand what I've just said. He definitely hears our prayers, and he will answer, but that answer may not be exactly what we're expecting. So I want to talk a little bit about what answer means in the context of prayer. I've often heard it said that God answers prayers in one of three ways. There's yes, there's no, and there's wait. So we're going to talk about all three of those this morning. And I want to start out by looking at the prayers that God answers in the affirmative, which are those where he says yes, and even those where he says wait. And can I go to the next slide? First and foremost, if we want God to answer us, we should pray in the name of Yeshua. And I don't mean simply just saying in the name of Yeshua, which is nothing wrong with that. We should still do that, but it means so much more than just using those words. 
That phrase in the name of is actually a Hebrew idiom, and it means as a representative of or in the authority of. So when we ask something in Yeshua's name, we're asking God the Father to respond to us because of our association with his Son. When we do this, it is not Yeshua representing us before God. It is us who is representing Yeshua as we go before God. And I want to use an analogy, a modern-day analogy, to help you understand this. If you work for a company and they give you a company credit card, you can purchase on behalf of that company. And it's because of that authority that that company has given you that you can do that. So there are two important facts about this relationship. God accepts the petitions on our lips due to the merit and virtue of Yeshua, not our own. And second is asking in Yeshua's name is not a license to name it and claim it. Instead, we have a license to ask only for things that pertain to our capacity as Yeshua's agents in the world, and that's important. And whatever we do receive in his name ultimately belongs to him and not to us. So back to that credit card example, when you purchase with a company-issued credit card, you're entitled to purchase only what is needed by your company. You're not able to use that credit card to go out and buy stuff for your own personal use. It's the same thing with our prayers. When we pray in Yeshua's name, we should be praying for things that align with his and his Father's will. So praying in Yeshua's merit as his representative is what it means to pray in Yeshua's name. And it does not require saying the words in Yeshua's name as a formula, but in Judaism, it's very common to use legal formalities when praying. So it's very much appropriate to do so. And I would encourage you to do that because it's a reminder to yourself of the fact that you're standing in his authority. He's given you that authority to go to the Father. But just realize it's much more than just that. So Bobby, can we have the next slide? Okay, I want to look at John 14, verses 13 and 14 quickly because they tell us something very important here. In fact, whatever you ask for in my name, I will do so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me for something in my name, I will do it. Now let's be honest with ourselves. Is the thing we're asking for something that will bring him glory, something that will accomplish the purposes of God, or is it something we're asking for only because we want it? That's an important distinction. Even if the prayer is for something good, it may not be something that's seeking to glorify God. I've actually heard people say, oh, I need a new Mercedes so that I can take, so that when missionaries come to town, I can drive them around in style. And you can drive them around in style in any kind of vehicle. It doesn't have to be a Mercedes. So to ask God for a vehicle is one thing. To say, oh, I've got to have that big expensive one is another thing. Does it truly glorify him or is it something that you need yourself, or you're wanting yourself? Everything we do should glorify our Father in heaven. And when we truly ask in the name of Yeshua, God will be glorified. And a good example of praying something in his will is praying for the peace of Jerusalem. He said in his word that we are to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So when we pray that prayer, we know we are praying according to his will. And can I go to the next slide? And this is 1 John verses 14 and 15. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. Again, many believers claim these verses believing they mean he will give us anything when we ask. And they overlook that phrase, anything according to his will. If we want our prayers answered, they absolutely must be in accordance with his will because he is all-knowing. He knows all things. But in order to know his will, we've got to know God. That means we have to study his word. We have to spend time in prayer with him, getting to know him. Then he can reveal his will to us. So I want to look at a couple of specific types of prayer that he will answer in the affirmative. When we come before God in repentance, asking for forgiveness and turning from our sins and asking for his salvation, he will answer that prayer. He longs for us to come before him and to accept him and become part of his family. 
And when we're sincere with that request, we know he will answer it yes. Also, when we earnestly and sincerely pray to know him better, and we do so with a pure heart, and we put forth the effort to study his word and to spend time in prayer, he will draw us closer to him. Those are two prayers that we know, without doubt, he will answer. Can we have the next slide? We have a beautiful promise in Psalm 37, verse 4, and that tells us to take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. As I reflected on the song that I'm going to share with you in a little bit, I contemplated the time God answered my prayers. And I thought about two excellent examples that I'm going to quickly share with you this morning of where he gave me the desires of my heart. But it was many years later, okay? So this is that wait part. And in each of these two situations, I want you to understand that these were two areas that I thought were so far out of reach, I thought would never be accessible to me. I, I didn't even dare ask him to give me these things, but he knew the desire of my heart, and he gave them to me in his timing and in ways that would bring glory to him. The first is I had always wanted to attend college. Didn't have the money when I graduated high school. Grants and scholarships that are available now that are so plenteous were not that easy to get back then. I didn't even know where to start, so I just accepted the fact I would not be going to college. I went to a vocational technical school, got an accounting certificate, and then a few years later was able to go to the National Center for Paralegal Training when they were here in Atlanta as an employer-sponsored student. And I just accepted that that was the extent of my education. A few years later, I moved into my first apartment with a roommate, and it was on Dresden Drive off Peachtree Road in the Brookhaven area. And living there, I was constantly passing by Oglethorpe University. And if you've ever driven by there, you know what that campus looks like. It is beautiful. And I just thought, oh, if I could have gone to college, that's where I wanted to go. Okay? Not going to happen, but that's where I would love to have gone. In 1988, I joined Toastmasters. There's a long story about that one we don't have time to get into. But we had a club at my, my employer. And I got into a district office. And one of the, uh, our responsibilities was to go out and meet with other clubs and help judge contests. One of the clubs just happened to meet at Oglethorpe University. So I got to go on the Oglethorpe campus. I was so excited and went there several times, actually, and just assumed that's as close as I would ever get to going to the school. But at least I had gotten on the campus. I'd got to see inside of some of the buildings. And so I was excited with that. Then Steve and I married. He was traveling a lot. A friend of mine at work came and told me that she was getting ready to, she, like me, had never been to college. She was getting ready to start a program, an evening program, that Oglethorpe University had just started up for adults. I went home, talked to Steve about it, and he encouraged me to sign up because he knew I'd always wanted to go. And Linda and I started the class together. I got my degree from there and something I never thought I'd be able to do. So God had given me the desire of my heart to get a college degree and to go to the school I had wanted to go. But you want to hear the icing on the cake? The reason I had not gone to college out of high school was money. Guess what? God provided the funding through tuition reimbursement through my employer. Steve and I figured it up when I was getting ready to graduate, and it would have cost us because it's a private university, and this is several years back. It would be even more today. But around that time, it would have been somewhere in the neighborhood of $37,000 for that four-year degree. Out of pocket, it cost us less than $1,000. Only God can do something like that. The second desire took even longer than that roughly, I guess it was 20 years, a little more than 20 years to be answered. And I'll go into more detail in, on it when we talk next week, uh, but I want to give you a little teaser. I had always wanted to dance since I was a child, but it wasn't until I was well into my 40s and here at Beth out and I that he granted the desire of my heart, and he did so far exceeding anything that I ever could have hoped for. So you have to stay tuned to hear that story. But know this, only God could take someone who so longed to dance but didn't have the opportunity and provide the wonderful opportunity he's given me here. God said no to dance when I was young, and I just wanted to do it because I wanted to do it. It's something I wanted to do. But when it was time 
and I had the opportunity to glorify him with it. He opened the doors wide. So let's go to the next slide. And we're going to talk now about the more difficult part of this, when God says no. God is beyond our full comprehension. So we don't always know why he does what he does. But there are some very common reasons why he will often tell us no. And I want to look at a few of those this morning. The first one is God doesn't impose his will on us. Okay, he will not force us. We are not automatons. We have free will. I mentioned a few moments ago that one of the prayers he will always answer is when we come before him in repentance and ask for salvation. But think about this. Does that extend to our prayers for the salvation of another person? Not necessarily. Because while it's always God's will for us to come before him and repent and receive his gift of salvation, it's a choice that has to be made by the individual. We can't impose our will on someone else, and God will not impose his will on them either. He will not force them. So no matter how much I want someone else to know God, that person has to be willing to know God before that prayer will be answered in the affirmative. Now, that does not mean that I should stop praying. Even if I see no change, I should still continue to pray and believe because my prayers will continue to have God intervene and do everything he can to try to change that person's will and try to get that person to receive him. The fact that that person doesn't seem to be responding should not be a deterrent to us. We should persist in prayer. There's a story by Dutch Sheets in his book, An Accessory Prayer, about a man who prayed for his friend for years. I mean, it went on and on and on and on and on. Finally, the man died, the man that had been praying. He died. His friend had never accepted the Lord. But there, at that grave site, that man's funeral that day, as that man was being put in the ground, his friend accepted the Lord. So while he never saw it, his prayers were answered. So don't ever give up. And what this tells us is that God wants to answer our prayers. We need to keep praying, we need to keep trusting, and we need to keep believing that he will do so. Another reason, a second reason that God may not answer our prayers the way we want is there may be sin in our lives. Psalm 66, 18 tells us, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. And it's not just that he won't answer, he won't even listen if we have sin. So, if we're not getting an answer, either a yes or no or whatever, we may want to examine ourselves and see if there's some unconfessed sin. A third reason, God may be keeping us from harm by saying no. Have we ever thought about this one? Author B.M. Palmer tells a story in his book, Theology of Prayer, about a woman who had spent the entire summer in the U.S. away from her children. And as you can imagine, at the end of the summer, she was anxious to get back home to them. And she tried to book passage on a certain steam liner, but there were no rooms left on it. So she wound up having to stay in New York for an additional two weeks. Obviously, she was not happy about her return being delayed. But a few days later, that sorrow turned into Thanksgiving when she realized that that ship she had tried to get on was now at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. So his saying no was actually a blessing. And in more modern times, I know we've all heard stories from 9-11 about people who escaped being in the World Trade Center or either on the ill-fated flight that crashed into the Pentagon. And the Wall Street Journal published an article a couple of months after that event stating a, a number of people who had escaped. One woman who thought her luck had taken the turn for the worse had been laid off from her job on the 105th floor of the World Trade Center on 9-10, the day before the attack. So what appeared to be tragedy to her was actually a blessing. It saved her life. There was another man who missed work that morning because the transmission in his brand new BMW sport utility vehicle went out the night before and was locked in first gear. And he had to deal with it, so he was not there. These things we get angry about sometimes. Don't realize that there may be a reason why we're being prevented from being someplace. There were others that overslept. They decided at the last minute to take another flight. People injuring themselves uh, 
sprained ankles, all kinds of things. It was just unbelievable, but they all changed the trajectory of their lives. Had those things not have happened, they would not be alive today to tell it. So I challenge you to think back on some of the times God has denied you something or thrown a monkey wrench into your plans, that light you've been caught at, uh, the car that wouldn't start. Maybe that was God protecting you. And I think things like this happen in our lives a lot more frequently than we realize because we have angels around us protecting us. And there's a reason. So think about that the next time one of these things happen. A fourth reason God may not answer is he has something far greater in store for us. In John chapter 11, we read the story of the death and resurrection of Lazarus. Yeshua had been told Lazarus was sick, but he delayed going to him. And when he finally did arrive, he was told by Martha and Mary, Lazarus' sisters, that he was already dead, so it's too late. Yeshua could have gone straight to Lazarus when he heard the news, and he could have healed him instead of waiting those additional days, but he didn't because God had another plan that would bring greater glory to him. When he got there and saw uh, Lazarus was dead, he went to the tomb, he called him forth, and Lazarus returned to life. I know I've had many times in my life when God did not answer my prayers the way I wanted, but then later would provide something even better. Two years after Steve and I married, I was approached by a co-worker who was getting ready to leave the company where I work, and he wanted me to apply for his job. I had some experience in that area, and he thought I would be a, an asset to that group. It was one of those jobs that's very process-oriented, which means you basically do the same thing every day, the same way. So over time, it can get monotonous, but it would have been a nice little promotion for me, and I was very excited. There were a number of red flags along the way uh, that I should have listened to, and I didn't. But I did ask God, if this is your will, give me this job. So I did leave it to him. Didn't get the job. The job was actually given to someone who had no experience in that area. And I had one of someone who knew that group come to me later and tell me, said, if I'd known you were applying for that job, I would have told you some things. So God spared me from that angle. But guess what? Three or four months later, we were all called into meetings and found out that the company was going through a major reorganization. And it always means job cuts. I was told that very day when they announced it that my job that I was in was safe. I didn't have to worry. But that group I'd interviewed in, they were all put in a hold pattern. They were pending internal assessments of the various jobs. And it would be another two or three months before they would find out whether they still had jobs. That job I'd interviewed for, gone. The guy who had that job, gone. All I could do that morning when I, when I was told that was sit there and just say, God, thank you, thank you, thank you for not giving me that job. But there's even more to the story. He, as a part of that restructure, our group got some work from another group, and my manager wanted me to take on that work. And I really adapted to that work and really enjoyed it, started doing contract negotiation. And it's something that is challenging. Every, every contract negotiation is different, even if you're negotiating the same type of agreement, and I do a wide, wide range of agreements now, but even with the same type of agreement, everyone is different, everyone's unique. So you're always learning, you're always challenged. And that led into the role that I'm in today. So it was not the job that I had asked God for and begged for, but God had a different plan. So keep that in mind when he says no, that he may have something else in mind. Some of our prayers, this is another reason, may be for things that in the natural are impossible. And while God can, and sometimes does, intervene supernaturally, most of the time he chooses to work through the natural order of things that he's established. And this is one that can be really hard to accept. We hear all the time on the news about people who have disappeared, and we pray and pray they'll be found safely, and then when they're found, they're dead. Well, while we're praying, they're already dead. God can supernaturally raise them, and as we saw with Lazarus, and he's done this even in more modern times, raise people from the dead. Most of the time, he doesn't, because people have free will, and someone chose to take that life. And it's hard for us to understand that. It, it, it hurts. It's difficult. But the reality is we live in a fallen world. People have free will, and these things are going to happen. So we just have to turn them over to God, even when we don't understand, and trust him. 
I want to give you a story. It's a little lighter than the murder thing, but it shows this concept in a very good way. And the story comes from Probe Ministries. There was a carpenter who was building some crates for clothes that was to be shipped by his church over to an orphanage in China. It was during the Depression, so we'll get into all that in a moment. But on his way home, he reached in his shirt pocket to pull out his glasses, and they were gone. He remembered putting them in his pocket that morning, so he drove back to the church thinking he had left them there, but they were nowhere to be found. So as he retraced his steps over the day, he realized the only thing that could have happened is as I was sealing up the crates, I leaned over and they fell out of my pocket. They're now on a crate. They're gone. They're on their way to China. There's nothing I can do about it. The Great Depression was at its height, and the man had six children to feed. He had spent $20, which was a lot, of, a lot of money back then, for those glasses that very morning. They were brand new. It's not fair, he told God as he drove home in frustration. I've been very faithful in giving of my time and money to your work, and now this. So he was angry with God. But several months later, the director of the orphanage was actually on furlough in the U.S. and wanted to come by and visit all the churches that had supported the ministry. So he came by one Sunday night to the church where this man attended. And as this carpenter and his family sat in their customary seats on the back row of the church, the missionary began by thanking the people for their faithfulness in supporting his orphanage. But most of all, he said, I want to thank you for the glasses you sent last year. You see, the communists had just swept through the orphanage, destroying everything, including my glasses. I was desperate. Even if I had the money, there simply was no way of replacing those glasses. Along with not being able to see well, I experienced headaches every day. So my coworkers and I were much in prayer about this. Then your crate arrives. When my staff removed the covers, they found a pair of glasses lying on top. The missionary paused just long enough to let his words sink in. Then, still gripped with the wonder of it all, he continued, Folks, when I tried on those glasses, it was as though they had been custom made for me. I want to thank you all for being a part of that. Now, the people listened, and they were all happy for this miraculous miracle here that they just heard about, but... In their heart, they were thinking, certainly he's mistaken because there were no glasses on the list of items that we were to provide and send overseas. But sitting quietly in that back, with tears streaming down his face, an ordinary carpenter realized the master carpenter had used him in an extraordinary way. So he was able to see exactly why he had lost those glasses. And he could have prayed and prayed and prayed, God, bring those glasses back to me. And God could supernaturally have given him more glasses. But in the ordinary course, it was not going to happen. And a sixth reason is God's refusal doesn't necessarily mean he's punishing us. It may be preparation for something better. Sometimes we tend to think God's angry with us and punishing us when he withholds something. But the better likelihood is that he is preparing us for something better. Romans 5, 2 through 5 puts it this way. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. And because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom God has given us. God's molding us to be the bride of Messiah, and that requires developing characteristics such as perseverance, character, and hope, and his denial may be part of that process. And I want to tell you another story. Uh, A group of women were studying the book of Malachi, and as they studied chapter 3, they came across verse 3, and that states, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And the women were puzzled by this verse, and they didn't know what it meant. What does this tell them about the character of God? So one of the women offered to get with a silversmith and find out about that process and see if she could find out something that would help them. So that week she called a silversmith. She made an appointment to watch him work, but she didn't tell him why. She told him nothing about the Bible study and the questions they had. As she watched him, 
He held a piece of silver over the fire and he let it heat up. He explained that in refining silver, one needed to hold the silver in the middle of the fire where the flames were the hottest in order to burn away all the impurities. The woman thought about God holding us in such a hot spot. Then she thought again about the verse that he sits as a refiner and purifier of silver. She asked the silversmith if it were true that he had to sit there in front of the fire the whole time that the silver was being refined. The man answered yes and explained that he had not only to sit there holding the silver, but he had to keep his eyes on the silver the entire time it was in the fire because if it was left in the flames even a moment too long, it would be damaged. The woman was silent for a moment and then she asked the silversmith, how do you know when the silver is fully refined? He smiled and answered, oh, that's easy. Catch this. When I see my image in it. So we need to remember that when God tells us no and we suffer as a result, that God the Father and his son Yeshua have their eyes on us. They're watching us. They want to ensure that the difficult times we are going through will remove the impurities in our lives and mold us into his image so that he can see his image in us, but not leave us there so long that we are truly damaged. So keep that in mind. Can we go to the next slide? This one's an interesting one. Can we change God's mind? And there are different viewpoints depending on who you ask about that. But regardless of your position, there are some scriptures in the Bible that seem to suggest that we can absolutely change God's mind. And I want to give you two, I want to look at two of them closely here. Um, but I want you to be prepared. When we change God's mind, that changes a lot of things, and it, not, it may not always be for the better. So I want to start with Moses. We've been reading a lot about Moses lately in our weekly readings. After he led the people out of Egypt, he, being guided by God, led them to the foot of Mount Sinai. He then went up to the top of the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. But he was gone for a long time, and the people became restless, thinking he was never going to return. And what happened? When he did return, he found them worshiping a golden calf. The people were so rebellious. God was so patient, but they were so rebellious that he got to the point he wanted to destroy them all. He told Moses he was going to destroy the people and make a new nation from Moses. What did Moses do? He went to God and pleaded with God on behalf of the people. Please don't spare them. God relented. He changed his mind. But we see after that decision over and over again throughout the Tanakh, the Old Testament, the people rebelled against God. They were stubborn. They were disobedient. And all that disobedience ultimately led in, their, in a 2,000-year exile from the land. Now, would that have been the case had Moses not convinced God to let the people live and instead let God create a new nation from him? We don't know. But one thing it seems pretty certain. People who had never been influenced by the idolatry in Egypt would have probably been much more obedient to God and a lot easier for Moses to have led. Okay? Second example, and this one should really make us pause and think about what we're asking for. King Hezekiah. If you've ever studied Bible history, I'm sure you're familiar with the righteous King Hezekiah. His father was the godless King Ahaz, and after King Ahaz passed away and Hezekiah took reign. He purified and repaired the temple. He purged the idols from the land and he reformed the priesthood. So he did a lot of good for the nation. He destroyed the high places where the people had sacrificed to pagan gods. And he even destroyed the bronze serpent that Moses had made at the command of God because it had become an idol that the people were worshiping. He reinstated worship of the true God at the Jerusalem temple and history remembers him as a great and good king, a God-fearing and faithful servant. However, he later became ill, and the prophet Isaiah told him to get his house in order because he would soon die. Isaiah chapter 38, we see where Hezekiah prayed, and he pleaded for his life, and God changed his mind and let him live an additional 15 years. However, the events that occurred 
during those 15 years raises questions about whether it was a good thing that he did live or not. So let me tell you what happened during those 15 years. There were two things. First, after Hezekiah's healing, the king of Babylon sent gifts to him and he sent ambassadors to him. King Hezekiah was very naive and he welcomed them. And according to Isaiah 39 verses 1 and 2, Hezekiah showed them the house of his special treasures, the silver and the gold and the spices, the precious ornament and all the house of his armor and all that was in his treasures. There was nothing in his house nor in all his dominion that Hezekiah showed them not. And that was foolish because King Hezekiah actually gave the Babylonian ambassadors a motive to come and attack Judah by showing them all the riches of the nation as well as revealing all his weaponry and his defenses. So he set the nation up for attack. And sure enough, after his death, the Babylonians did attack Judah and they took all the riches of Israel and also took the people into captivity. Second thing that happened in those 15 years, three years after Hezekiah was healed, his wife bore him a son, Manasseh, who began to reign at the age of 12 when his dad passed away. Unfortunately, Manasseh, who would not have been born had King Hezekiah died when God originally had ordained, immediately began to rule in an evil manner in the footsteps of his grandfather, King Ahaz. He sought other gods. He implemented human sacrifices. He dealt openly with demons. He led the nation into such sins and abominations that Judah became more vile than the corrupt heathen nations that had lived in the promised land before the Israelites came into it. So the point is, if we persist long enough, there may be situations where we can change God's mind. The better question is not, can we change his mind, but should we change his mind? Because God's will is always best. God knows best. He has a lot more wisdom than we do. And another point I want to make is that these examples are very different. But there's a common denominator here. The reason he did change his mind. In each case, he was glorified, even in changing his mind. He will always be glorified, okay? In the case of Moses, his compassion and willingness to grant grace and mercy were on full display, okay? Ezekiel 20 recaps this whole event, and it reminds us that the reason God changed his mind was to protect his name among the nations, the Gentiles, uh, most, the majority of people in this room. The Gentiles had seen how he had delivered the people from bondage. They knew how powerful he was, and yet they saw him forgive them and let them live. Even, and even had he killed them, they would have come out and said, look, he just led them out to the desert to kill them. So he was glorified. Okay, but even so, even though God had relented and let them live, the people's continued disobedience prevented all of that original generation that left Egypt, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb. Even Moses was prevented from entering into the land. Something to think about. And he King Hezekiah, those extra 15 years that he lived, some bad things for the nation of Israel, but there was also a good side. That was 15 more years of peace in that nation, 15 more years for the people who did not know God to come to know him. So there was even good in that. There's a third example I'll mention very, very briefly, because you may be sitting there thinking about it, that I'm ignoring it, I'm not. Abraham pleaded for God to spare the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. In that example, God agreed with Abraham's request to spare the cities if 50 and 40 and 30 and all the way down to 10 righteous could be found. But there's a couple of big differences with this story. First, don't you think God had already looked at this and he knew there were not even 10 people in those cities that were righteous? So while he said, yes, I'll spare them, he knew he was not going to be able to do it. Second thing that's different is he wound up um, doing exactly what he said he was going to do in the beginning. He destroyed the cities. So although his mind was changed, the outcome did not change. And as I prepared this lesson, I pondered about how different my life would have been if God had answered all my prayers the way I wanted him to. And I'm not talking about the little piddly prayers. I'm talking about the big, life-changing prayers. And one thing I can tell you with assurance is that man sitting right there 
if God had answered my prayers the way I wanted, I never would have met him. We've been married for 21 years now, and I have trouble even comprehending and remembering before I knew him and had him in my life. So I would not want to change that for anything. So all the times God said no and the, the pain and the hurt, I'm thankful for it. He had something better in mind. Also, the job I'm in now, as I said earlier, I'm in a much better job than the one I had wanted. Uh, one, I would not be here with you this morning. I'll tell you right now, because things would have been so different in my life. I would have been on a completely different path. And each and every one of you are a very special part of my life and a part that I would not want to not have in my life. So God's no's have truly turned into blessings for me. So can we have the next slide, please? Being told no and being told wait is the story of my life, as I told you a little bit about this morning, and I suspect it's probably the same with each and every one of you. That's because our Father in Heaven longs to give us good gifts, those gifts that are best for us, because he knows better than we do what is best. Matthew 7, verse 11 tells us, So if you, even though you are bad, know how to give your children gifts that are good, how much more will your Father in heaven keep giving good things to those who keep asking him? And all things should be attested by a witness. So we have a witness here. James 1.17 stands as a witness. Every good act of giving and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father who made the heavenly lights. With him there is neither variation nor darkness caused by turning. But, and this is important, his idea of good isn't always aligned with our view of it. He knows in his infinite wisdom what is ultimately best for us. Parents, you know that here on this earth, sometimes you have to tell your children no in order to protect them and help mold them into the responsible adults you want them to grow up to be. It's the same with God. He may prevent us from getting involved with a certain person because he knows that person would be a bad influence for us and may possibly even pull us away from him. And I could go on and on with example after example, okay? So let's talk about now how we should respond when God says no. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 tells us this, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you and Messiah Yeshua. In other words, we need to praise him and give him thanks for what he is doing in us because in doing so, it will allow him to refine us just like silver is refined and make us more like him. We should give thanks even when we don't understand why he isn't answering us the way we want him to. My father died in 2002 at the age of 66 from cancer. I had prayed for five years for his healing. Then, one morning in prayer, God spoke to me one year before he died. So he, this went on for six years. And he said, your father has cancer and he will die from it. It wasn't what I wanted to hear. I kept praying for his healing, but my prayers did change because I would say, but if it's not your will, then please be with him, give him peace, help him not to be afraid, give him the strength he needs to face the situation God answered that second prayer immediately. I saw a change in my dad. Uh, Steve will remember my dad had always been a very quiet person. He suddenly became very vocal about his faith. He and I had opportunities to spend time one-on-one. -on -one. I had uh, the blessing of being able to take him for one of his blood transfusions, and I saw how he ministered to the nurses there. I saw a whole different side of my dad during that last year of his life. And I still don't know why he didn't heal him. He could have. I, I know he touched a lot of people and blessed a lot of people in that last year. He could still have touched and blessed them, and then God healed him short of death, but he didn't. So I just have to trust God and know that there was a reason. God didn't create cancer, and I, I want to make this distinction right here. Um, sickness, disease, death, all these things came into this world because of the enemy with the fall. In Genesis, God did not create them. The enemy took, and he's the stealer. He's the life, life killer. 
But God can work through these situations, and sometimes he allows them to run their natural course, and he did in this situation. But I just have to trust him, and I know, my, I know where my dad is, and I know I will see him again, and that's what has given me comfort since the day he passed away. And I'm not suggesting you thank God for cancer or any other illness or tragedy. What I'm saying is that we praise God and we give him thanks for who he is, for all that he has done for us, even when times are difficult. We should pray and acknowledge him as our provider and put our trust in him to work all things together for our good, as it tells us in Romans 8.28. Furthermore, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called in accordance with his purpose. While we may not always understand the why, we either trust him to fulfill his word or we don't. Getting angry at him or feeling sorry for ourselves when we do not get what we want is not the answer. And there's one last thing I want to touch on. Uh, in a previous teaching, I had taught about forgiveness. And we don't just need to forgive ourselves and others. There's sometimes we need to forgive God. And that may kind of shock you for a moment, but think about this. Sometimes when we don't get what we want from God, we become angry at God, and we pull ourselves away from him. That's, we shouldn't be doing that. We should forgive him. We should realize there's a better plan here. There's a bigger plan, something we can't see in the natural eye. That loved one you prayed for that God didn't heal, like my father, are you still angry at God about that? The relationship he said no to. Do you still think longingly about what could have been with a little bit of hurt at God for, for denying you that relationship. I've actually known people who were angry at God because he didn't bring a spouse or family into their life as they had planned. And they, in some cases, have even held him hostage. They've said, okay, God, I'm not going to church. When you bring a spouse into my life, I'll go back to church. I'll go back and serve you. They need to forgive God, okay? That's, that's what I'm talking about, release that anger, that hurt. What we fail to realize in the midst of our hurt is that when God says no, there is a reason. And what I've given you this morning are just a few of the reasons, the more common reasons, but there could be others as well. If instead of rebelling, we submit ourselves to his will, it's amazing what he will do in our lives. And I want you to take just a moment and think about some times that you've been told no by God. Sometimes he will let us see why he told us no, such as the job situation I told you about earlier. And other times he may not. But regardless, we need to trust and know that he has a plan that is infinitely better than anything we can imagine and trust him to fulfill that plan in us. And what I want to do at this time is I want to ask Bobby to start the video. I want you to hear this song. And the words, we've got a lyrics version up here so you can see the lyrics. I want you to make this your prayer for those things that God said no, that you may have not completely released to him yet. So if you would. And I don't know if that link's going to work. You may have to pull it straight from YouTube. And the video's not showing, is it? It's easy to understand, so even if we don't have the lyrics, but it's just better if we have them up.
Thanks, Bobby. For those of you that are on Realm, I'll post this uh, either later tonight or tomorrow because I want, really want you to see the lyrics. And if you're not on Realm and don't even know what Realm is, you can go out to YouTube and just type in Things You Never Gave Me, David Meese, and pull up the version with the lyrics because I'd really like you to see these lyrics because they cut right to the heart. When I couldn't see the path of the storm, when I wanted less than what you had in mind, when I wanted more, than I could handle at the time. Those are some of the reasons he says no. But as the song says, when I needed you, but turned you away. How many times have we done that? You wouldn't let me slip out of your hand. He's faithful to accomplish what he wants to in our lives. So let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this time this morning. We want to thank you for who you are and for all you've done for us. And Father, we want to come before you and confess any sins that may be keeping us from you and that may be preventing you from answering our prayers. Father, we want to ask that you would help us to accept your will, even when that will may not align with our own desires. We want to thank you for the times that you've told us no in order to protect us or to give us something better or teach us something that will help mold us more into the image of Yeshua. Help us that we would always praise you, even when things are not going the way we want them to go. And help us that we would trust you, and that in your infinite wisdom, you will work all things together for our good. We just pray now that you will be with us through this service, and help us that we would just totally worship you with our whole heart, whole mind, whole being. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>